just by way of introduction and before I, I take a, a seat as well, if I move from your, the audience's left towards myself, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Ruben Berg, uh, Gunditshara, oh, sorry, I asked for pronunciation, uh, uh, Gunditshara man and founder of the direct, and director of the Indigenous Architecture Victoria organisation as well as RJHB Consulting. Ruben's an architecture graduate of the University of Melbourne and is currently an adjunct uh, at the University of Monash and he's the co-author of an important 2013 study, Indigenous Place. Uh, his activities are driven uh, by a commitment to the engagement of Indigenous peoples with architecture and amongst his many other activities, he's an Indigenous heritage advocate uh, with the National Trust. Next towards me is uh, Associate Professor Andrew May, who carries the entire history of Melbourne in his head uh, because he was the editor of the Encyclopedia of Melbourne. He's currently based in the School of Historical and Philosophy Studies uh, at the University of Melbourne and uh, is well placed to speak on history and memory because he served on advisory committees to the National Trust, the City of Melbourne, the Public Records Office, Heritage Victoria, State Library of Victoria, Melbourne Immigration Museum, the I'm going to tell, tell, say them all, Andrew, the Royal Historical Society of Victoria, the Melbourne Museum and the National Archives of Australia. Now, that is just one enormous raft of memorialising organisations. Uh, Tom Nicholson uh, is a Melbourne-based artist who teaches drawing at Monash University in the School of Art, Design and Architecture. And in recent years, Tom's work has explored elements of commemoration in language, in monuments, in banners, processions and historical sites. And earlier on this year, he collaborated with Jonathan Jones and Auntie Joy Wandon Murphy on uh, Future Memorials, an exhibition at the Tarawara Museum of Art commemorating the 150th anniversary of the Corranderk community. And last but by no means least is uh, Professor Ray Francis, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Professor of History at Monash University, as well as Deputy Chair of the Australian Intercultural Society. She's a member of the Anzac Day Centenary Grants Committee for the electorate of Hotham and has taken part in research and community consultation around uh, activities that have recast uh, historical monuments in ways that allow them to reconnect with Indigenous perspectives and perhaps even renew monuments to speak against uh, their original, uh, if you like, consecration. So those are our experts, uh, committed all of them to history, community, uh, place and its meaning and I'd like to shuffle over and join them and begin with a few questions. Our questions will be partly to individuals but very soon I expect uh, you'll hear uh, them start to talk amongst each other and don't forget to jot down that point or question you might have as it occurs to you so we can return to a lot of these ideas during question time. So, Andrew, I just want to start with you because 525 monuments in Melbourne. Does Melbourne have a, mon you know, a particular obsession with monuments? Or uh, <laughs> you, you must know. You must have a graph in your head. Of the Look, I think, I think there's, probably, there, there's a few kind of caveats, I suppose, about, about monuments and memorials in Melbourne. And I, don't, I, I think... Um, there's, there's a kind of a haphazard approach, I think, historically, I would, I would say, in general. And I think the first thing that one could say about monuments is that the, the, the process of memorialisation itself has a history, and that uh, you know, lines up with both uh, artistic and aesthetic movements and also contemporary political and, and uh, historical ideological moments. Um, so whether it's a, a search for nationalism, whether it's to do with uh, connections with, with the empire, different, different moments create their own conditions under which uh, monuments and memorials are produced. Um, so I don't know that we have a particular obsession. I don't think any more than anywhere, anyone else. I think being a settler colonial uh, cities in a settler colonial country, there are, there are, there are probably particular issues that, that Melbourne is, is sort of exemplary for confronting. Uh, but I think our monuments 
reveal things both about the events or the people that they commemorate, but they also, they also kind of look and tell us about uh, the, the, the sort of particular contemporary cultural context in which they were produced. So a Burke and Wills monument might tell us about, you know, Burke and Wills dying in the wilderness in 1961, um, but the the, the, uh, the statue that was built in 1865, which is, is in fact is the first memorial in Melbourne, uh, at which virtually, without exception, all of Melbourne's population sort of turned out for that funeral procession and, uh, in, uh, when news came through. You know, so that tells us a whole lot about that uh, contemporary search for, for heroes in that kind of particular context. So I don't think it's unusual, but I think it's most interesting place to, uh, to discuss some of these issues. And, and I think that's something we'll return to later, that people, if you like, engaged with memorials in quite different ways. And I think that's something that's, you know, turning over in a lot of people's mind is, you know, how, how to, and I might throw this one to you, Thomas. Do you, I mean, do you, what do you think the fundamental language of memorials has been or, or has become? Are you seeing the language shift? Because you've worked in, you know, you've worked with cans, with, with World War I war memorials, with banners and flags and processions. You've, you've, you've used a lot of different languages of memorialisation. I mean, I think the, the public languages of monuments and memorials has shifted enormously, I mean, both here and overseas, and artists understandably resist those classical Languages, languages of obelisks and big stone things and try to find more supple ways to describe those histories. But I also think those older languages are immensely rich. I mean, they're partly rich because they outlast their original context, so they start to produce different meanings or meanings different to the ones that were intended. Um, I have a friend, a Romanian, who grew up in the context of very particular monuments who talks about the Freudian slips of monuments. And there is a sense in which many monuments sort of inadvertently bear particular meanings. And I think the Burke and Wills monument, which I think is an incredibly, I mean, is a, a very strange thing and has this weird homoerotic thing in, that's, that's present in it, um, that perhaps becomes more present or more fully articulated now than it was then. So, and for me, there's also a very beautiful set of languages around commemoration, which are rituals, like the banner marching, um, which is, you know, a very ancient, tradition and is an, an old tradition in this city in terms of the celebration of that, um, that eight-hour day, which we were talking about at the, at the beginning. Um, and there's something that's very important about those, those languages as well that aren't necessarily concrete or granite things, but that can be reanimated as ephemeral things in the life of the city. And I think so all of those things are kind of rich source material for, for artists in terms of what they do in the public sphere and what they want art to be. Mm -hmm. Ruben, do you, th I mean, I'm thinking of your work around the the uh, Indigenous Place project. I mean, do you see sharp distinctions between, I guess, an Indigenous conception of, of place and and memory, and you know, the kind of the built colonial landscape? It's 525 monuments. I, 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 someone from the council might correct me, but I believe their count is that three of them relate to Indigenous <coughs> commemoration and the other 522. Yes, there's uh, a small number of uh, memorials that are about Aboriginal people and I think you find if you look at all of them, they're mostly all located on the fringes of the city as well, they're right on the edges and in the, down the little parts that you're not necessarily going to go, so they're not there in the main part to show, yes, we're celebrating Aboriginal people, they're very much pushed to the edges, which I think tells a bit of a story. Uh, and I think hopefully in the future we can do some more work to bring those things out into the light so they're, they're not seen as something that's on the edge. And I think part of that sometimes comes from Aboriginal culture is seen as some other, some different thing that doesn't belong to other people. But my sense of it is that Aboriginal culture is so much based on place and on the land and that if you're living on this land now, then you're part of this culture and you should know and, and understand it. And I think that's an obligation and, and something that everyone should, should do, look to do that's on this land here, because that is culture. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I guess, if you like, you, you, I was interested, Tom, you just said, obviously contemporary artists aren't interested in obelisks. It, uh, I'm, 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 if no one else does, I'm going to ask you about that obviously <laughs> later. But, I mean, it sounds to me like there's a meeting there that is much more about process and dialogue and, and 
I guess, language, uh, languages of memory rather than a big pile of rocks that inspires us all. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have said obviously, because actually I think... <laughs> no, because I spotted it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of my favourite monuments in my memory of Melbourne is Fiona Foley's Lie of the Land, which is a stone thing which was at the front of the town hall temporarily, sadly. Um, but I think that's a good example of an artist in a very immensely potent way using that, that language of the weight and permanence mm -hmm. of stone to give light to a, a sort of under articulated narrative in the city's history. Mm -hmm. So the obviously certainly shouldn't have been there. <laughs> and I, I think that obelisks just... are actually are interesting in fact. So but it's that they need to be re thought or reinscribed. They can't operate as they were intended in the I guess I, I mean I haven't forgotten your eyes. I, I guess where I, I was jumping in there was I mean we we were already starting to talk about a history of the monument and I guess I wanted to pause before we started saying oh it's all about style, you know, that back then it was all figurative, so they made these, and now we're all abstract, so we make these. It's much more complicated than just changes in, you know, the behaviours of artists, thank God, or, you know, we'd be all living a very different life. Ray, do you, you're, as you start to work with the committee around uh, the Anzac, various sort of World War I and Anzac mm. commemorations that are really going to occupy a lot of people for the next four or five years, are you seeing any changes in people's attitudes to memorialisation? Because we, we are all aware of that syntax of the digger on the, mm. on the plinth. Sometimes the head's bowed, sometimes it's not, sometimes the rifle's held up. You know, it's a very narrow mm. syntax. Are you seeing people starting to think about different ways of commemorating now? Mm. Yeah, I think they are. And I think particularly people are thinking about um, what the digger didn't stand for. So there are proposals, for example, to have um, nurses uh -huh. as the image, and I think there's one already approved that's going to be down at Port Melbourne. Um, there are proposals, too, for um, people who are commonly not even thought of in this context. For example, grieving mothers. And I know there was a proposal, which I don't think has succeeded, to um, have a statue of a grieving mother within the grounds of the shrine precinct. Um, again, someone who in the Australian context is not necessarily thought of. It is in the European context, much more so than here. We tend to, to concentrate, as you say, on the, the valiant figure of the, of the digger. Um, I think there's also people thinking about um, who else was not commemorated by the, the white male digger, um, indigenous servicemen, for example, mm -hmm. but also um, people from other conflicts. So I know there's a proposal also for a Turkish memorial that will not necessarily have a, a statue of a, a, a Turkish man, but something um, that will symbolically recognise the part that Turkey played in the First World War and its subsequent attitude to its relationship with Australia. So I think, yes, that there's a lot of different thinking mm -hmm. going on. Um, and uh, I'm only aware of part of it. I'm sure there are people here um, who know um, about other things that are going on as well. I was always struck uh, thinking about the way we perhaps underestimate earlier, the earlier complexity of monuments. I'm thinking of that remarkable speech that Ataturk made mm -hmm. where he said to the people of Australia, they're our sons now. You know, we, you know those, those dead at Gallipoli are our sons. And, I mean, that, that struck me as a remarkable uh, open gesture back then. I mean, sometimes we do forget that people's mm. sorrow and their commemoration and their memorialisation was much more complicated. Yes, and, I mean, that was unquestionably a brilliant act of statesmanship and resonates very strongly, particularly with Australian visitors. But there's also an argument that there was a political element to that. It wasn't just a spirit of generosity and reconciliation. It was actually making a point that they are buried in our soil. This is still Turkish land. Mm -hmm. So you, know, okay. you, you could read it in various complex ways, I think. I think, I think just jumping out, I think a really interesting um, sort of corollary of that is this notion about, about the sort of emotional, the emotional context of memorials. And if you think of how how important the whole ANZAC sort of landscape is and how we've got an we've got a, a intense sort of public commitment and buy-in to that. 
when we think of uh, monuments like the one to General Gordon, which probably I don't know how many people in the room know where that is um, or who General Gordon was, um, up in the Gordon Reserve from the 1880s. Uh, now, people at that time would have had the same emotional connection to that, to that hero of empire as he was, which has been kind of completely sort of dissipated over time. So these kind of cycles of, I think, historicising our emotional um, uh, sort of attachment to these issues as, and, and trying to sort of, you know, re remember the emotional attachment that people had at the time. You know, Ken Livingstone, I think, the, the, mayor, the mayor of, of London in uh, 2000, in, uh, uh, commenting on Trafalgar Square, said, who are all these kind of dead generals like Havelock and Napier? No one knows, knows who they are, but does that mean we should, you know, shuffle them off to the, to the storyard and put up some new ones? Or do we use these, however kind of imperial these commemorations are, do we, do, we, do we still want to know what they meant to people at the time? And will people in 200 years want to know what the new statue of the digger means to us? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, I think we're going to keep chasing that one around the room and, and, and to good purpose. And, and to prompt that further, I'll just throw to the, you panellists some comments from the City of Melbourne itself, which has recently published a document entitled Forms for Monuments to Complex History. So the City of Melbourne itself is, is, is recognising some of the issues you've already raised. I'll just read you this passage, because I think it's got some pretty central phrases, and it says... The importance of open-endedness in the meaning conveyed by a monument is that it invites debate and ongoing interpretation. This promotes a sense of something living and ongoing that can pose questions to and continue to stimulate passers-by over time. That said, the trait of permanence in a monument can be important for conveying the sense that the history they deal with matters. So we've got some remarkable key words in there. Open-endedness, the idea that a memorial can pose questions or, I suppose, in reverse, evade questions. Uh, the notion that a memorial is about debate and ongoing interpretation and that figure of permanence and change. I mean, I'd be interested in, your, in the panel's responses to those. I mean, is, are we just constantly weaving our way fluidly through these shifting targets, or is there, is there a moment where you just plant a flag and say, this matters, you know, I want to make a declaration about this, and I'll stand here and, can and I, take questions? Can, can I jump Go in and in. say that, I mean, yeah. what I love about monuments is because they do usually represent a point where people... Um, do take a stand and say, this is what we want to remember and this is the way we want to remember it. And for a historian, that's brilliant because you can take your students there and say, you know, mm -hmm. what was going on? What were people thinking? And they can go and research it. And it's, it's a wonderful window into a society in a particular point of time. And as you said, you know, the project that uh, my colleague Bruce Skates and I were involved in interrogating a monument to explorers who were killed by Aboriginal people and then subsequently led a punitive expedition against those people. That was a fabulous teaching exercise for historians and it led to actually a counter memorial. But in that whole process itself, in subsequent years, will make, again, a fascinating way to look at, at history because that was a moment in time in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s to see um, what kind of arguments were put, what kind of engagement occurred with the Indigenous mm -hmm. people, the local council, the press and so on. So um, I think if you have monuments that are too open-ended, they, they, they slip through your fingers and you can't see what it is that the society's mm -hmm. wanting to express. Mm -hmm. Tom, you're reaching there. I know <laughs> all of you have got something to say about this, but far um, I away. think uh, one of the, the paradoxes of monuments that insist upon a particular meaning, that wants to control the meaning that we give to history, and to have this exaggerated visibility to insist on never going away is that they become invisible to people. I mean, I taught a unit last year which was itinerant in the city with a group of art students who were fantastic, asking them to respond to particular sites in the city. And it was striking to me how many of them simply hadn't noticed monuments because many of the monuments that populate our city become invisible paradoxically by virtue of insisting on this one meaning that they would like to articulate 
for, you know, in perpetuity. And I think the necessity of a monument which is more open-ended is that it, re it remains active in people's imaginations in a certain way. And I, there's no easy answer to how that would occur. I think it's a, it's a very difficult thing for an artist to make a monument which doesn't die in public space. Um, but part of that is the way in which a monument is surrounded and, or, and regularly animated by rituals. And I mean, the, the Eight Hour Day monument is a good case in point where through different trade union rituals, people return to that form and, and renew its meaning. And it's, I mean, it's most obviously true in the case of um, World War, I mean, war commemoration in Australia in general. And those monuments that we do notice are, are noticeable in large part because they're animated by particular rituals. So for me, the, the open-ended thing and is somehow a necessity that, that our monuments don't become enormously overblown, but paradoxically invisible to the, city, the life of the city that swarms around them. I mean, I'm sure we're going to keep coming back to this question of the particular language of, a, of commemoration of the monument, but I actually just want to open up that point a little more. I was struck reading uh, histories of, of, of the unveiling of 19th century monuments in Australia that, uh, as, as Andrew uh, suggested, literally thousands of people would turn up, football crowds would turn up for the unveiling of a sculpture. There would be a day's holiday, there'd be sporting carnivals, marching bands, podiums would be built for the speeches, statues would be garlanded with flowers. I mean, question, have we just forgotten how to use monuments? You, well, you can't, you can't sort of future-proof the open-endedness, if you like. I mean, when you think of, when you think of the Burke and Will statue or the, the, the can up in Royal Park or even the Eight Hours Day Memorial, you know, in that heyday of the street processions, when uh, annual picnics and trade picnics and St Patrick's Day processions, you name it, the, the, the memorials and the monuments were places that people like pass, like either stations on the cross or, 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 or places of kind of secular worship. Um, so they were tremendously embedded in that particular time. But of course, as, as those meanings sort of uh, disappear historically, they become a bit evacuated with meaning. I mean, I guess memorials are like any material object that in a sense have their own biography. You know, they, they, their, their meaning and their purpose changes over time and they can be forgotten or discarded or, or reused for a, another purpose or, you know, shifted off site and then, I mean, we, we have a number of peripatetic memorials in Melbourne who've, that, that have seen that kind of life cycle. Um, and I don't, I, I, I think that's just the nature of... Yeah popular memory. I'm just curious, how does it work though? Because I'm, if, if I'm hearing almost a spectrum where you say, look, we've got to do something to throw a spotlight on the monument somehow, or uh, actually some of them have just got to be farmed out. There's probably a some block of land where, similar to where they take the old thoroughbreds where you could just pop all the old statues. But I mean, can we keep doing, or, or I guess, and, and this is, I don't mean this negatively, or the sense that maybe we put a lot of footnotes on statues <laughs> that, that say, it says, you know, everyone used to love this guy, but, you know, now we hate him, or, you know... Now we're you know, or, you know, or, or, or yeah. this guy had a wife who actually did all the work, you know? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you know, we're already hearing a lot of these compensatory tactics, but I guess, Ruben, I'd say, and this is, I, I, I warned you I'd be asking some dumb questions, but... I mean, would you like to see a statue of William Barrack on a plinth in the middle of the city? No, I don't think that sort of thing would be appropriate. And we saw there was the suggestion of having the William Barrack portrait building at the end of the Swanson Street, looking down Swanson Street, and um, I think that was probably a bit inappropriate for an apartment building, to making that sort of gesture. Mm. Uh, but I think what you want from a monument, I think the ritual part of it is what's really important, and I think it's a, a monument that you can actually engage with. So a monument that I engage with very regularly is the, the Great Petition uh, monument up at the top of um, Tasman Terrace, near Tasman Terrace there, uh, which is about mm. the women having the right to the vote, mm. uh, which was, at the time, it was only non-Aboriginal women who had the right to vote, because it wasn't until 62 when Aboriginal women did, but this commemorates the petition put forward to give women the right to vote, and it's the big scroll that you actually you can walk part walk through part of it and so you actually engage with it and you get close to it and you have a sense of it being there and that it's purposeful and if you have something up on a big plinth you don't you can easily just walk past it and not, not engage with it and even if you have a look at something like Larry Latrobe the, the dog which you walk past and you rub its ear 
And that, those sorts of things that you actually engage with have much more meaning for people, and that's, that's what you want from a monument, I think, something you interact with and engage with. Does that... Well, Tom, you're waiting to chip in. <laughs> I mean, I, I would agree with that. For me, a, a very exemplary contemporary monument is um, Misha Ullmann's monument to the book burnings, which is in Bebelplatz in Berlin. And it's got lots of those classical 19th century monuments around it, you know, sculptures of the Humboldt brothers and so on. And when you see the square, you just see these people looking down onto something on the ground. And you, it's only when you get there that you realise it's actually an underground monument with a portal that you look through. And what's striking is that it, it induces an active act of looking. I mean, that thing of how you engage with it, um, it produces something very different, and it also suggests that history is not something authoritative which looms above us and that you scoot past on your bike, but something which you approach and actively reflect upon. And to me, also the way that it, it has the figure of history in our city as a kind of absence, like as an empty room under a square, is somehow more true to what the spectre that history is but, than... But, Tom, I'm going to... And I'm, I to again, <laughs> I've, I've warned you in advance, but you've, you've just remarked on the fact that sculpture, you know, the, the, the chap on the plinth somehow becomes invisible and yet you're admiring a contemporary language of sculpture that is embedded, ambient, softly spoken. I, I, mean, I know that it, it's, it's... I'm with you looking at a lot of these new highly discursive forms of, of sculptural language in public and yet they seem to deliberately step into the background. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I want chaps on <laughs> plinths, but... I mean, I would say that the... But there's a similar paradox. It's because it, it's a more reserved thing that it then it asks for a particular kind of attention and therefore gets it. And so it, it, it produces a more thinking response to what it is. And I don't think it's even particularly discursive. It's a very simple form. It's not full of words or complex kind of notions that you would only access through knowing about contemporary art. It's a, it's a very simple and haunting thing which... And it, it, the beautiful thing is that when you do ride past it, you, you look and you see 15 people doing this, looking over the square, and you don't even see it, but you then have this um, imagined or memory to, the, to what it is to be there. And I think that that's a much more beautiful and gentle and living way for us to have history populate our streets. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm not, I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious that Melbourne is so, you know, vertical... But and and it's it is it's it's a if I may a city of phallic memorialisation you know it's shafts and and guys but now we're saying can we can we actually speak more it seems to me you're all saying can we speak more about the idea of history not not the not the fellow who planted the flag but the idea of colonisation you know not not the winner of the war, but the people who suffered, you know, through that war. It's, it's, a, it's much more emotional and, mm. and abstract. Mm. Well, the proposal um, for the monument in Fremantle, which I was speaking about, the, the Explorer's Monument, the proposal that didn't succeed was actually the proposal that came from the Bijidanga community that was mm -hmm. involved um, in, in this... Um, killing in, in the 1860s, and their proposal was actually for something um, much less monumental, and in a sense it was um, stone seating in a circle around a figurative water hole um, with the inscription, let us sit down together in peace. But the council thought that was going to be too expensive, I think, and um, also too intrusive. So they opted instead just for the footnote plaque, um, which said there's another side to this story than the one you see here represented in the brass reliefs and so on. So our equivalent to, I mean, I guess, the, Andrew, the old 19th century processional unveiling was, as you say, the Stations of the Cross. It was kind of civic religion. We would all, you know, as a congregation, worship the hero. Whereas now it sounds Tom and, uh, and Ray both, you, uh, and Ruben too, us seem to be suggesting you, you want people to act out. It's a different kind of ritual, a subtler one, you, but you still want to act out a relationship to history. You want to look into your past. You want to sit down and share. Uh, I, think, I think I make two sort of glosses on that. The, f the first is I think it's a, it, like potentially it's a slight misreading of 
the sort of grandiose 19th century with that legacy of, 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 of men on horseback and so on that, 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 that has been left to us, that everyone kind of thought that way. I mean, in, in spending a lot of time reading through, you know, memorials and statues are kind of created by committees, and, and, and as Ray said, you know, great ideas come up that aren't always en enacted, but it gives you a sense of some of the preoccup preoccupations that people had. I think sort of monuments and memorials are very much about sort of placemaking, about, about the way people feel attached to place, whether in an indigenous sense or in a settler colonial sense. One of the most interesting um, letters I've read to the Melbourne City Council in the archives, I think it was around 1900, was someone who remembered a, tr a, a dead tree that was on the bank of the Yarra that had stood there since the, the, the 1830s. So it must have been an old red gum on which early settlers had scratched their initials and written things, and they proposed to the council, and it also had the, 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 the flood mark of the 1863 flood, and the suggestion was that they build a bronze replica of that tree. Now, you know, what an what a amazing kind of evocative sense of mm -hmm. experience of place, the, the, the environment, the con connection to, you know, to, 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 to community and so on. So, so I think people, people always make these sort of small everyday connections to place and have done, you know, since time again. Um, on the other side of the coin, when you were talking about the, um, the, the scroll, like the immediate thing I think of when I think of that petition is what used to be on that site, which was an old um, underground public toilet from the 1920s, which was, I think, heritage classified by the National Trust and, and so on. So this sort of, the city is this, you know, constantly overwritten site. Um, and of course, we have we have we have an added dimension now in terms of the social embeddedness, which is virtual virtual space and the internet and the way that we can, you know, through various apps and other other imaginings and super impositions that we can actually layer space and our understanding to space, even as we move through it, with some of these other counter histories and, and alternative views. And that 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 I mean, that's that's kind of radical. In a, in a sense, I don't think it's necessarily been sort of optimised yet, but I think it's a... And that gives on to the, 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 the two very obvious questions, which is what is historically significant and, to, and who decides? Uh, so you thought, I mean, it's been committees, it's been, you know, in the 19th century, uh, chaps with fancy facial hair, you know, taking up public subscriptions. I mean, there's always that sense that the, the, the forms of commemoration land in a public space and we learn to live with them. But well, can it, can it yeah. change? I suppose kind of regimes decide at, at one end, and if you think of in, in sort of a post-colonial context like India, in Delhi, all, all those old 19th century statues of famous blokes are all, have all been removed to some park and they're all dumped, you can go and see them in sort of Ozymandian kind of, you know, glory. So regimes decide, new, new orders decide, um, but, and committees decide. There's, there's a sense of, I think what we, you know, if we, if we put ourselves, see through the eyes of, you know, where, where, where are the memorials that speak to me? As, as an individual, as a minority, whatever, H how are people disenfranchised, I guess, and it gets back to this issue of, well, where are the, where are the indigenous memorials and so on. Um, so it is about, it's very much about power structures in society and, and we, 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 can't, we don't always admit to them. There are great silences still, I think, about, um, about that aspect of who controls mm. public space. But there's also opportunities, I think, in the public realm for people to create their own memorials, for the public to decide they want to have a memorial around something. And I think we saw a little while back there was the white bicycle occurrence where people were putting up white bicycles where someone had, had died who was on a push bike. And that was the public just saying, we want to memorialise something. And, and when we had the um, unfortunate incident where the wall fell down up near the CUB building, that people made a monument out of that place. And so there is still a power, I think, for people to say, we would like, this is something that happened and is important to us, and we're going to, through our actions, celebrate it. And then if that, I think, continues over time enough, then that can then become a more permanent monument. But I think that that touches on me, this idea that how long after an event do you memorialise it might have some impact on how, much, how well it is remembered further in the future. And there might need to be some sort of 
time limit on how soon something happened that you can make a, mon a monument out of it, because if you make a monument out of it straight away, you might actually think later on that wasn't the best idea, which might have happened with a lot of the monuments that we have, that they came about too quickly. That's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to backpedal now, <laughs> um, in as much as it seems to me like a actually what you're all suggesting uh, is that what the work needs to be done on the culture of commemorating, not on... I mean, we need almost to, the, to foster that desire to commemorate, to encourage it, to propel it, rather than to say, there's a site now, and here's an anniversary date now, what's it going to look like? Uh, in, in, and Andrew, your comment, I suppose, we've got the capacity with Google Maps or any a number of other kind of, if you like, wiki-type uh, activities. I mean, anyone could write uh, a map of Melbourne that showed an alternative sequence of commemorations. If they had that will to commemorate, you could you could map it. Uh, you know, if you like, an entirely personal. You know, this is where I. You know, bought my first pet, or you know, this is where I had. You know, pranged my car, or I mean, I'm mean, in all seriousness, yeah. mm -hmm. those are yeah. uh, often people's very strong memories. Their map of Melbourne is intensely personal, but will never warrant a plaque or sculpture. Mm. I, mean, I think people do self-organise memorial forms in an interesting way. I mean, I remember hearing Tony Birch talk about camp sovereignty, that the camp that was over in the domain during the Commonwealth Games here, and talking about the way that that camp very self-consciously occupied that space, which was stamped out with all those colonial monuments. And I mean, there are many things you could say that camp sovereignty was, but one of them was a kind of an, an improvised monument to dispossession. And so I think that and that's a self-organised thing. The state didn't do that. That wasn't power. That was a particular community that self-organised it. So I think in all kinds of ways, like very sm in small ways or in collective ways, people do organise ways to try to articulate histories that power would otherwise push to the margins. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm not... I'm always tempted to bring things to artificial conclusions. So the, 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 the will to commemorate and to memorialise has not has certainly not gone away. Um, perhaps some of the languages are questioned and perhaps we've lost some of the languages. I mean, y you've worked a lot with processions and, I mean, that, that's not as common as it used to be. You know, the collectivity, the community demonstration of commemoration but then we've got equally new technologies that could massively multiply the commemorative landscape. And maybe that's our challenge, to think of Melbourne as a memory space in the broadest possible sense, rather than, you know, a set of plinths. I mean, it was interesting when you read that um, quote from the policy document, you mentioned this conundrum around permanence, like how do you have an op something that's open-ended but permanent? And I think it's worth mentioning that some things are literally only ephemeral, like that Fiona Foley work that was at the front of the town hall for probably only six months. But every time I go past that, the front of the town hall, I have that work in my head. So there's a point where a work which is only literally temporarily there is sufficiently potent that it actually inscribes a space in people's minds. And I would say the same about, for example, Christo's wrapping of the Reichstag, that it's very hard to look at that building without also having the image of it wrapped up. And so I think that there are, there are ways for things to endure well beyond their physical presence in the city if they, if they work in a potent way. Mm -hmm. Can I, I mean, I mean since we're, we're going down that path, can I ask all of you, uh, is there a monument or a, 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 a commemorative site or monument that, that, that exists now that Melbourne can do without? Can I, I'll start with you. <laughs> can I volunteer um, the wipers statue down near the shrine of the, the man in the full armour with a gun? Very aggressive. Used to be out the front of the state used to be library. Outside, yeah. lobby, and now it's down there outside the shrine. Um, I think, Gee, good luck with that. Oh, it's not going to happen. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't smell the shrine. I'm not that bad. <laughs> um, but I think, to me personally, I find that very ugly. And um, every time I see it, uh, it just makes me feel bad. Um, I'd like to see that one gone. Okay. But I, as you say, I don't think that's going to happen. But, but, <laughs> but you put it out there, Tom. Uh, I, I 
wouldn't go without any of them, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> in the sense that I think that they're... I mean, there are a lot that I dislike intensely, but I feel like I would like them all to be there and for people to find different ways to give them meaning rather than to knock any over. Andrew? Well, I'm going to half cop out as well. I mean, I think <coughs> I, I, I think I agree with Tom, but I also, I also think that the, the very fact that there's the possibility that if that if enough people felt that that a particular monument should go, then it would then it would go. Do you know what I mean? So, and I think that says something about, I suppose that that there there is a sense of public space being a kind of participatory site, where understandings of, of the past and the present can still be, can still be negotiated. So, uh, I, you know, there's, there's many monuments and memorials that, are, that don't mean much to me, but I would never take them away. But I think the possibility is there that we could, which is probably a good thing. I'll take a punch. I'll get rid of something. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would say the, uh, the John Batman Memorial down at Queen Vic uh, Markets, mm which has, has got a little footnote on it, but it does say that he was there and he found Melbourne unoccupied. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, there were lots of people here. It was not in any way unoccupied, and so I think that's something that, that uh, doesn't need to be there in that sh shape or form. And he's a curious one, going back to Andrew's point earlier, because there were plenty of people who had a very low opinion of John Batman uh, in his own day, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just as there were many people who, who called Gordon a butcher and, mm -hmm. and wondered why people were passing around the hat mm -hmm. for a sculpture. Well, the reverse that round, what's a monument or a, a, a memorial that we need that we haven't got? I'd be happy to see some of the proposals that people have put up for some of the, the unrecognised um, sacrifice in the First World War. I'd be happy to see a, a nurse's one and I'd be happy to see a, a grieving parent of either sex for that matter mm -hmm. to remind us of the cost of the war and shift the focus a bit from the valorisation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the for me the monumental landscape of Melbourne is completely dominated by the colonial process and also the anxieties around the colonial process. So it need, I think it, there needs to be, I don't know whether it needs a monument though, but there needs to be a different a way of thinking about the process and ongoing nature of dispossession in the city. I'm just not sure whether I would say there needs to be a monument, because yes. it, but it, it, I think that there needs to be a kind of commemorative system in the city that, that that enables us to think about that history and that ongoing reality. I mean, I guess if it's not cheating to say two things, Chris. No, 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 yep. no, you're One an artist. <laughs> There's no such thing as cheating. One of the things that I think is, partly because of the nature of wars that Australia have has fought in, one of the things that's remarkable about monuments in this country is that so many of them refer to places elsewhere. Um, and I think that that's actually something very interesting about the, these monuments that populate not just Melbourne, but little towns everywhere. And um, that sense of a form which exists in our streets but which makes us think about some, someone somewhere else is important and, for me, suggests that, we, that someone should commission an artist to make a monument to refugees. Mm -hmm. and, and I've probably overused the word monument because mm -hmm. it seems to me that we're really talking about memory and in all its languages and technologies rather than just its concrete form. But, mm -hmm. Andrew, have you got a, is there a... In the, is there a blank space in the memorial landscape? I think I might find know? that letter from the archives. So I think that idea of the tree, the, the bronze tree, is a really good one, actually, because it, you know, it, it, it speaks to, um, it speaks to environmental issues. It, speak, it speaks to sort of deep time. You know, the tree, the tree that connects the sort of the, the, the pre-European occupation. Um, the river is such an important part of this of the psyche of the city as well. I, I think that'd be a, a wonderful memorial. Ruben? Uh, I think, um, obviously, the, the story of Tanamenawe and Malbahina uh, needs to be commemorated in some way up, up near Old Melbourne Jail. But again, that's something on the outskirts of the city. And I think, uh, possibly, in whatever form it takes, something that actually commemorates the Aboriginal people of this, this land. You know, corner of Burke and Swanson, I know. The three men who brought their work to lunch is a, a nice statue, but I think we can do something around in that area that has, you know, really brings to the heart of the city uh, and the acknowledgement of the traditional owners of this land that we're all a part of. And, and each of you, in your own way, spoke, I, I, I mean, with passion about that, but I, 
a certain imperative as well. And I, I, I mean, again, I want to ask a big question. I mean, is it a, is it a duty? Is commemoration a duty? I mean, it's it, in some ways it it it, it, it looks it's it's part of a, of a of an urban landscape now. It's a, it, it it's got a little bit of amenity. It's got a bit a little bit of history. But I mean, what about just that that notion of a civic act, uh, a, 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 a requirement to recognise and, and commemorate? Was it, or am I pushing that too far? I mean, again, I, I did say I grew up in the chaps and maps era where you were, you know, every Anzac Day, you know, you were read out a story of bravery, you know, in, in the schoolyard and it was... It was if there's a consensus that there should be, then it will happen. I mean, if, if you know what I mean? So it's kind of like a, so in the same way as if there's, a, if there's a, a counter consensus, then that will happen as well. I mean, there is the capacity. So, so duty, it's not, you know, the, the, the um, committee that was formed around 1910, I think it was called the Victorian Monuments Committee that had, you know, Frank Tate and the Royal Historical Society. I mean, that was kind of a bit to do with, with maybe the sort of sense of duty or civic pride or altruism that was more about sort of town planning aesthetics and so on. But if you mean, you know, is there always a role for the memorial to really cut to the, the visceral core of what's important to a, a society at a particular time? Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I was going to make a similar point that I think that um, Memorials and monuments do provide an opportunity for communities to think about what it is they value. And of course, it's always a political exercise. Mm. There are some people who won't share those values, but I don't know whether it's so much a duty, but I think it's, it's an imperative that communities have to actually try and express what they have that holds them together. I mean, Ruben, your example of the ghost bicycles was, I guess, it, it, some people would dub that what they call active citizenship, in as much as a group of citizens said, we want to commemorate this person, but it's also about a larger issue. It's about mm -hmm. safety and, I mean, I don't want to sound nerdy about it, but it's about the capacity of people who operate one kind of vehicle to be cognizant of people operating others. It's, it's really, uh, I mean, it, 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 there was, a, for me, in, in your example, a strong sense of duty towards each other and a, a kind of a collective sense of shared urban experience, shared safety, valuing of other people, literally valuing of other people's lives. So, mm. I mean, duty is not a, a salute yes. to, you know, yeah, if, it's a, if it's an inner, inner driver of, a, you have a sense of duty yourself to, to commemorate that, I think that, that can be a very powerful thing, much more powerful than someone saying you have to, commemorate something that's never really going to get into your heart. And I guess one final question. I'm, I'm often struck by the success, albeit often controversial, of the so-called fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square in London, which is, is an, was it always stood there as an empty plinth, allegedly uh, reserved for Queen Elizabeth II, you know, should she ever uh, pass. Uh, but in the, in the interim, every year, an artist was invited. It's got a chook on it now, isn't it? It's, it's got Blue a. a, 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 a I've lost. It is a chook, I think, but it's had everything. Uh, mm. uh, but but that, that always struck me as another, if you like, the compromise position was to say, here's your plinth in one of the most prominent squares in one of the most prominent cities in the world and form an orderly queue and you can have a go. And in fact, <laughs> one contemporary artist uh, did just that. He, he organised a project where anyone who wanted to could stand on the plinth for a half an hour uh, and, and, and each of you was your own monument. But, you know, it does seem to me that there are sometimes quite simple organisational ways of, of acknowledging the historical form and the contemporary fluidity at the same time. And I, 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 if, if I can put my two bobs worth in, a version of that in Melbourne, you know, uh, the plinth as speaker's mm. corner, you know, might be a, a way to go. Mm. It's a bit like the modern version of the Member Monarch. Well, <laughs> that's... <laughs> Every the, year. <laughs> we could have... Well, I, I think Melbourne... Melbourne has a remarkable tradition of parades, mm. and it's not... It's something Melbourne has done hilariously mm. with, uh, with Moomba, but solemnly mm. in many other ways, and, and maybe that's another way of doing it. Um, you know, 
I'm sure the city of Melbourne wants to organise two or three processions <laughs> every year for forever, but it's an option. It, look, I, I, I mean, I want to thank you all for uh, hosing down some of my more egregious uh, questions and uh, th being so thoughtful and open-ended, if I may, uh, in, in your analysis of memory. And I'd like to throw it over to the audience now uh, for your questions and comments. Just uh, look, I, I've, I've spotted one over there and then you, and, uh, and I'm running out, but I'll, I'll come back to the foreground. So, well, you're number two. So now, so we've got a second question over there. There, I've only got one mic. Now you go ahead. Go ahead, and I, I can see hands up going everywhere, and I'm going to try and match the, the pattern. Okay, it's sort of a, a a rail to arms and a question as well. Um, there's been a lot of mention of Fiona Foley's um, sculpture. Lie of the land, if people know what it is. So the taking of the land was a lie and it was based on Batman's treaty, uh, which is the stone uh, pillars with the words engraved in it of what Batman wanted to claim Melbourne with, which was flower, beads, looking glasses, I guess that means eyeglasses, tomahawks and blankets. And that sculpture that Tom talked about was in Swanson Street, uh, Swanson Street and people had to walk around it uh, and it was seen to be an obstruction and so it was removed. That sculpture is now on the lower ground of Melbourne Museum and hardly anyone gets to see it. But I think that's the monument that epitomises Melbourne and that really should be back either in Federation Square or... So that's my little campaign. I, 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 <laughs> I, in the Q&A in the tradition, I'll take that as comment. Uh, but, but no, it's a great comment and, and I have to say, if I can add, add as a footnote, I think Fiona Foley is actually one of the most under-recognised public artists in Australia when you look at uh, not just the complexity of the issues she tackled but the imagination with which she responded to. Now we've got a question and I've, I've spotted a cluster at the front. Sorry? Comment on, on the Fiona Foley? I mean, great idea. <laughs> we agree. Right. Thank you to the panel for a fascinating discussion. Um, I wondered, though, if you'd like to say more about those people who've opposed memorials, who've passionately opposed them. And I'm thinking here of the Shrine of Remembrance, which Ken Inglis would say there was a huge movement in Melbourne which opposed uh, spending so much money on the most expensive war memorial in, in the world when the needs of that society, the needs of returned men and their families were, were so apparent to everyone. So with every memorial there's been a contest, hasn't there? And we've had a lot of talk tonight about consensus and shared value, but we're reminded, aren't we, of just what a bitter point of debate every memorial is in its making. I wonder if the panel would like to comment. I think, I, I think Bruce that gets back to the point I made at the start about um, sort of monuments looking, looking two ways, that they tell us about an, an event and they also tell us about a contemporary context for that event, which, as you say, can be very, can, can be very uh, fractured and, and contested. Um, and I think, I mean, I think that the debate about the, um, some kind of memorial to um, Tanaminawe to Mabahina is a really interesting case in point. Um, and at one of the previous Melbourne conversations, there, there was, there's clearly a bit of tension around whether, whether such a memorial um, seen through, through the eyes of promoting those two as kind of freedom fighters, for example, is a kind of a, anachronistic projection back on, on maybe what was going on at the time. There, there, were those, there are those who might argue that um, while Judge Willis was the one who sentenced those two men to death, the jury actually had recommended acquittal. So you could see in that space perhaps, you know, more, more contested meanings. But it's going, it's going to say a lot about what we all think <laughs> about that issue, which is contested, and, and importantly so. So absolutely, it's a really good point. 
If I, if I may chip in, uh, as I mentioned to Andrew at the start, I, I found an article in the Bulletin of 1890, front page story, that said in 1890 that there had been to date no Australian who deserved a monument. So there's equally that, that issue as well. Now, just with questions, I know there's a cluster up here and I know there's someone up the back waiting and we've got a solid 20 minutes, so I'm sure we'll get to everybody. But I, and I just wave harder if you think I've missed you, but I think I've got the lie of the land. Fire away. I'm going to just ask a question about the Queen Victoria market because the Queen Victoria market between uh, E and F sheds contains the only cemetery marked as Aboriginal in the city of Melbourne, and that is now, of course, a trading area. And uh, for all I know, what I believe is, in fact, Aboriginal remains actually spread out through the entire cemetery for various reasons, which I can explain separately. But the, so the question is, what would manifestation do you think there should be in the Queen Victoria market, since they're about to bulldoze half of it? What do you think should be the manifestation of the Aboriginal heritage of the area? Well, I think as, as much as possible, we want to leave things untouched. I don't think we want to disturb the remains, as, if any way we can, and try and leave them at, at most rest that they can be. But I think there needs to be some physical acknowledgement that that is actually happening there. But I think the most appropriate people to discuss it with are the people whose ancestral, who are the, the ancestors of those people. And uh, they're the ones that need to be discussed and talked about because if it was someone else's ancestors, we'd want to talk to them and find out what they wanted for their ancestors. So we should do the same for those Aboriginal men and women who were buried there. But there needs to be some acknowledgement that, it, that it's there and they should be protected. What well, I mean, to open that question out a little further, I mean, the many layers of history, physical and, and if you like, metaphorical, uh, in, uh, 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 I, mean, I guess I'm turning to you, Andrew, is are we beyond uh, the material space or the material memorialisation in as much as, I mean, to be put it crudely, we could go on forever. Mm. I mean, every layer you peel back, there's another memory. Oh, well, that's true. Uh, I mean, in relation to the Queen Vic site, I mean, I think, I think it's a tremendous opportunity to, to both um, problematise that, that site uh, as, a, as, as representing the whole sort of dispossession process and, and, and the whole um, sort of settler colonial uh, friction and, 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 uh, and legacy. Um, and it, it, I think it could, I mean, I don't know what the plans are for that site, and, 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 and uh, as Reverend was saying, I mean, there, there, there's important considerations about consulting uh, descendants and so on, but I, I could imagine that that could become a tremendously significant site in Melbourne psyche, even should there be nothing erected there, or, you know, that some kind of restitution of the place as a, as a, as a site on which people can project these... these um, this, it, it's a process mm -hmm. of memory and of potentially of reconciling that past. So, you know, of, of all the sites in Melbourne that have opened up, I think that's a tremendously important one. Now, we have a very patient inquisitor at the back. Hello. Hello. We can uh, hear you. Yeah, this, is a, um, it's from, uh, this is probably an unusual question, but uh, the idea of stigmergy is one that uh, in the in the analysis of hive animals. Uh, so the, the mark of work, it's a, it's a way that hives organize themselves they, uh, so that the individual uh, units within that, um, uh, that colony will understand what it is they have to do within the whole organizational structure. And it seems that to a certain extent, the, um, the, the memorials um, operate in that way. They, they guide you know, the overall understanding. But I'm link, I'd like to link this back to your reference or some, some references that were made uh, to you know, contemporary um, you know, uh, uses of, of uh, the internet, Google, uh, various different information systems. They're actually provide us, providing us with an instantaneous historicism one that we're, we're being caught up in almost, like right now I'm being caught up in the instant historicism of being trapped on camera and recorded data fed into this incredible you know, information network. Um, I, I just thought that it'd be interesting to ask what your thoughts are or what some of the panel's thoughts are on how we, how we seek to find or freedom within that kind of incredible kind of structure of, and how, how do we dememorialize or find 
you know, like a, a kind of a latitude um, in that kind of uh, structure. I'm looking at you, Tom, the more, the more allegorical member of the... the, the, the thank you. You are. Um, I guess it's difficult to know where to begin to answer that or respond to that comment. One thing which has been present for me during the whole discussion is a, a basic observation that the main large visual forms which populate our collective space now and which tell us something about how we constitute ourselves are not monuments but ads. I mean, that part of this conversation is that monuments are actually consigned to a quite marginal place in our visual landscape. And the way, I mean, I always think the monuments are interesting because implicitly they say something about what we hold to be sovereign. Like all those 19th century monuments in a certain indirect way tell us about how that society, what they regarded as sovereign. And in a certain way, I mean, I think that the advertisement is, the, I mean, I would say sadly, is the most potent visual form that occupies our collective space that tells us about what is held to be sovereign in our society, which is that we constitute ourselves by consuming. Um, so that's probably the, the, the first thing that came to mind when I heard you um, talk. I mean, you know, the Italian futurists back at the beginning of the 20th century had this idea of banishing the past from um, the visual landscape. And I mean, the 20th century art, which a uh, 20th century art history is an amazingly liberating history for artists now still, has a deeply antagonistic relationship to the monument and to the past and the way in which these things would crowd out our ability to live. Um, and I, it, that sort of occurred to me when you asked about duty, because I think there is a risk with monuments that we fall back into a kind of edifying Victorian idea of what art should be. Um, and as an artist, you often wonder, you know, why, why make something in the public sphere when you can put something in a gallery which is unencumbered by a lot of the constraints of public art, which is a very, very risk-averse sphere where councils are afraid of putting something up that will offend someone. And I think the answer to that is partly that, and the reason why the past is so important is that it helps us to live fully in the present. So never allowing monuments to become fetishizing of the past, but to think of the memorial forms that we create as ways to live fully and to think fully about the present, for me, is an important um, way not to become uh, yeah, not to allow history to become a thing of authority upon us. And um, how we think justly is from, uh, about our society is, for me, one of the reasons why we have to think about ways to commemorate that, that colonial history, but equally many other things that are, that are sort of put to the margins of our public sphere. I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing something else in your question which seems to imply that the question is almost, is it possible to recognise that memory is often intensely personal, private, you know, possibly only commemoration is meaningful only to you. And, and is it possible to traverse that intensely private with that almost grotesquely public openness of a digital culture? Is it, is it possible for us to give people a place, if you like, in the civic sphere in which they can be, their memories can be only their own? Oh, is, or is that the Wailing Wall or a... a did, did anyone do the Janet Cardiff walk at the Sydney Biennale this year, which is a kind of an iPhone that you, with headphones and it guides you through a video footage through the city, through the rocks? And I think that is, was an unbelievably successful work at doing precisely that, at sort of going back and forth between the, the necessarily private way that we encounter collective space and the fact that even within that conundrum we share certain meanings and spaces and histories that are important. So what was the effect on you? The strange, uh, for me the amazing thing was when I put it away and then I walked back to where I was staying in Sydney and I could, everyone that was walking against me, I was somehow trying to imagine the voice that was going on inside their head. So it, it just enlivened the public sphere in the most delicious way. <laughs> well, well, that is interesting given your hive me metaphor because this particular work would be, you know, you, 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 that, that artwork gave you a different consciousness of yourself in the hive then. But it was also a walk. I think it's important that those Janet Cardiff walk, works are walks. That you, It's an hour of traversing the landscape. It's not about a single form. It's about a, a way of knitting together through the act of walking and looking these different histories that constitute a city. Now let's look around. There was, you've been exceptionally patient and now you have the microphone. Um, I'm interested in uh, uh, what was mentioned before about the, the actual f interaction between people and uh, monuments or whatever they are. Um, 
and going back to Fiona Foley, I think her collaboration with Janet Lawrence in Sydney, The Edge of the Trees, has that intense sort of other way of discovering where you walk amongst these tree-like forms and it's about touching the difference between them and listening to the messages that are playing or looking, trying to find the things that are hidden amongst them and that brings a different sort of total experience to what it is and makes you fully involved. Compare that to the Bali uh, bombing memorial which was being used by people in the, what was considered very inappropriate ways where skateboarders were, were, were using the ramps and were inclined, you know, told not to and various ways were told to that that's inappropriate way of using that space. Um, but I, in my own experience with my friends who don't really think about these things at all, I think, but the, 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 the experience, the one where I feel they've they continued continually tell me that most joy is given to them in their daily traversing of the city are the, you know, um, ACDC Lane and a Medna Reveridge Lane that every time they walk past, there's a spark of joy is brought into their lives in that very populist way, but very simple way. You can take that as a comment if you like. No, no, I think that's a very astute observation. Is yeah. Are there simple ways, such as you describe, are there simple ways that can engender, you know, as you say, the joy of, of, of memory and, and honouring in, you know, in our daily life? I think, look, absolutely. And I think if there's, if, there's, if there's a difference perhaps between the, the, the 19th century and now, when you think of the city with the, you know, the spikes on the old you know, 19th century architecture which say, you know, stay away, don't, don't engage with this materiality. Um, there is, there is, a, there is, a, there is a, a, a difference now and I think, um, again, uh, Ray was talking about engaging students of history with the city. Any, any, anything that can, that can disrupt or rupture expectations or surpri surprise, you know, when I take students around and get them you know, leaning up against the tiles outside Young and Jackson's and tell them about the six o'clock swill and the spew that used to run down, you know, suddenly they, they, they feel it, you know, they feel, <laughs> feel it um, in a way that, that, that a history lesson can't. So I think that, that physical engagement with materiality is, is, is important and, and any sort of monumentality that can, that can do that is, is tremendous. Ray, how do you, do you, will an idea like, the, the ideas like the ones we've just heard, will they survive um, the, the, the onslaught of the 100th anniversary of Gallipoli? Um, I mean, I, I, I fear that there's going to be a... You know, we're going to you know, wind the clock back dramatically. Yeah, or, look, I fear that too. I, I actually don't think there's going to be a whole lot of building going on. I think people will say, pretty much we've got enough World War I stones out there now, and they're going to be, I'm, I'm hoping, they're going to be looking at more complex ways to think about it. Um, even, you know, engaging with the existing memorials we have in different ways. Um, someone mentioned about, uh, there was some discussion before, um, researching the names on the honour boards or so on. Um, and that can throw up all sorts of, you know, surprising things that complicate our understanding of what the digger on the plinth mm -hmm. means. Um, you know, that he actually went and got venereal disease, for example, and families have to come to terms with, with that more complex, I think, more interesting history than the kind of history that we You're have really been picking the winners now. <laughs> so we have if it's a monument to venereal disease, yeah. yeah. Um, Spanish flu? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's my hope. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether it will be realised. Mm. Yeah. I still have a, a memory of many years back when, because uh, I, I spent a lot of time in country Victoria, where a country town wheeled out the surviving World War I veteran on Anzac Day and stood him next to the, the monument in the town and they had the local radio station there and they asked him his memories and he said, I didn't want to go. Mm. It was a stupid thing. I didn't want to die. I only went because people would have called me a coward if I didn't. And, I, I, you know, it was a remarkable moment because this guy had carried that yeah. all his life. 
Yeah. And that was his memory. And, and, and not a memory uh, to the detriment of those mm. others who did go or to yeah. the people at that monument. He just wanted it on the record. Yeah. And, you know, people like Hugo Throssell, you know, who won the VC, um, was asked to open the local memorial. And, you know, he made a speech and saying, you know, I'm a socialist and a pacifist, and the war did this to me, which he wasn't asked to open anymore after that. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, there's probably time for one more question. And, oh, and you're waiting. Right. Great. Thanks. Hello. Thanks, um, I guess when I reflect on everything that's been discussed tonight, there seems to be a stark contrast in the, um, in the type of memorials and monuments that were left from the traditional landowners that were discreet and didn't leave such a... <coughs> uh, yeah, um, such a, uh, a how would you say it? a negative impact on the landscape, um, or phallic was the word I was looking for. <laughs> such a phallic impact on the landscape, and um, and I, when I think about it, so I guess you have monuments which are an expression of the rituals that the people partake in, um, and really the rituals are a reflection of the cultural and social values. Mm -hmm and they try to express the footprint or the impression that that person left on this earth. So with that being in mind, that it's really a reflection of the cultural values and the ritual is an expression of that, um, what would you say the type of monuments that we're creating say about our community and our cultural values and can our community take a leadership role in shifting our perspectives and the role of, um, and the role of ritual and monuments and, the, and what they play on our landscape um, and in terms of the legacy and of what we leave behind. Ray, would you like to take, give us the committee view on that? Um, what, I mean, I think it's yeah, a great question. What is... can we do about our own memory and posterity? Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, as, as citizens, clearly you can intervene where, where you are in positions where you have some say over projects and so on. Um, those of us who are lucky enough to be teachers as well as historians have plenty of opportunities to influence the way I think that um, people think and, and question at least, and it, tell them what to think, but at least encourage questioning, um, which I think produces different ways of responding to to issues. Um, it's, it's not a very adequate answer, but um, yeah, it's a hard question. Mm. Ruben? Well, I think um, part of it's what I touched on earlier around people having the power to make their own monuments and make their own rituals. And, and if there is something that's important in the landscape that you want to celebrate or an important person that's been forgotten that there already is a monument for, that we can have new rituals and find new ways of commemorating those people. And I think that's one of the things I always push around Aboriginal culture, that it's not something that's fixed and we have to celebrate and only participate in what happened a thousand years ago, that cultures change and evolve and we can all find new ways of celebrating people and, and new rituals that are meaningful to us now. And if they're carried on for another hundred years, they'll have that strength as well. The, I guess one of the things that I'm aware of is that we, we blissfully trot along thinking that you know, we're creating these memorials and monuments and it's... It's great from an individual perspective, but when you actually look at the impact they're having on the landscape, it's significant. In Melbourne, we've created a cemetery space twice the size of our CBD in 100 years. So if we continue at this rate with our population, we're just gonna create a huge sprawl of monuments and the impact on landscape is quite negative. Um, and I'm just saying it's really a reflection of our own cultural values and our desire to leave a, uh, a thing behind, um, but what we're leaving behind is not that yeah. great. I mean, if, if I, I just, and I, I don't mean this facetiously, there is at least one advocate of vertical burial in Victoria, which is if, if you just plant people vertically, you don't use anywhere near as much space. I mean, there are literally, you know, literally people proposing practical solutions. I guess I just conclude by adding just a, another example uh, in answer to your question. It, some years ago, I think in the last century, uh, a curator in Chicago, Mary Jane Jacobs, discovered that there were no monuments to women in the city of Chicago. So she researched, I think, about 50 women of note in Chicago, had a plaque made up, attached each plaque to a boulder, and just drove a low loader through Chicago in the dead of night, dumping these boulders onto the footpath. 
So, um, you know, it was literally a direct intervention. The next morning, Chicago had 50 monuments to women that hadn't been there the day before. And, I mean, in the full view of, uh, and on videotape of the, of the city <laughs> of Melbourne, I'll say, that is one answer to the what can we do, you know, is just go out Direct and action. do it, you know. Uh, look, those have been some fantastic questions and observations, and it's an absolute pleasure to me uh, to sit here with these panellists. I, I am so in love with people who are deeply engaged with history. It's the greatest pleasure you can have to, to invest in, in history and memory and, and, and try to answer all the difficult questions that history proposes to us, much less to do that in public. Uh, I'd, I'd also very much like to thank Geoffrey Taylor, who's quietly pulled this all together and handed around the mic uh, to our sound crew uh, and uh, to the City of Melbourne and, and Knowledge Melbourne as well, and to you, the audience, for coming along and engaging so strongly. And just a reminder uh, that if you care to stay in touch, uh, you can fill in a contact sheet at the back of the room uh, or uh, send an email to melbourne.conversations at melbourne .vic.gov.au. I, I, I know there'll be at least one people, person here who won't sign up. I'm thinking of the, 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 the question on the hive. Uh, but if you do want to come to more of these events, do uh, fill in the information sheet. And could you join me in thanking the panellists and the organisers for the event? Bravo. Thanks so much.